Hi friends. First of all, apologies for some of these sounds in the background. I'm not in my usual environment today, so I found as naturey a place as I could, but there's still going to be cars in the background. Oh, lost. <laughs> what a word. That word captures so much emotion for so many of us. It's one of those words that almost feels like the thing that it is. And for so many of us in today's world, it is something that has a powerful influence on our life. It's no wonder that wisdom traditions through the ages have warned against lust and its effects. But if you know me, the things that I share, you'll know by now that I'm not here to tell you that lust is a bad thing. But when it rules over our life, when it gets us into porn addiction, when it gets us having affairs, when it takes our mental, emotional energy and just consolidates it, takes it away from us, then it is a problem. So today I'm going to be sharing how to transform the power of lust in your life. <laughs> All right, let's go. Hi friends, my name is Kenton Whitman and together with my family, we aim to share wilderness skills, mindfulness practices, wild edible plants, family adventures, and skills that break you free from the limits of civilized life. Join us by subscribing to our channel and joining our YouTube family. All right, full disclosure before this video begins. I am in a monogamous relationship that is satisfying on all levels. So I am not challenged by the idea of lust as many other people are. And a lot of us, we don't have any outlet for our sexuality or we have a, a person in our life who is supposed to be the our sexual partner but there's not reciprocity going on there so there's all kinds of situations where we can be wrestling with this and I don't have to be wrestling with it so maybe I don't have the right to talk about it but Rebecca and I have been together for 30 years we started our relationship when we were young and certainly through my teens and into my adult years in the early parts of our relationship, this was a force that had a power, especially in my life, to throw things awry. So I do feel like I can speak from personal experience with this. Now, I mentioned all these wisdom traditions, speaking about lust as something that can interfere in our spiritual journey and not just our spiritual journey, but our regular lives. We see it all over the place today. I mentioned porn addiction, a big thing for a lot of people. If you are in a relationship, you still may be feeling yourself looking outside of that relationship for, for your sexual satisfaction. And you may be doing that behind the back of somebody. It may be not only the, the lust that's involved, but it might also be dishonesty and lying that's invoked through trying to satisfy this lust. And for those of us who are single, this can be a huge power where sometimes all we can think about is our sexuality or the lack of sexuality that we have, especially in a culture that really sells sexuality. A lot of advertisements we're going to look at, we're going to be bombarded with images of sexuality in some form or another. And that influences us. Our mental diet creates habits of desire. So this can be a really positive thing. I can really nurture myself with, let's say, positive community with some good friends. And I start to desire that. and want that more in my life. 
It can also be something here like that lust. It's always invoked. I'm thinking about it all the time. It's dissatisfying because there's no outlet for me and ah, it just eats us up alive. Now, another reason that wisdom traditions warned against this is that this sets our mind into the very state that civilization itself tends to put us into, which is a state of never-ending desire. It doesn't have to be sexual desire. Most of us have experienced this. There's, there's desire for things, to collect more and more money, for instance. Almost all of us in, in the Western culture have been encouraged to just hoard up as much money as we can. It's very interesting to live among the Amish who don't have that same ideal of just collecting a whole bunch of money. They might have some for a backdrop, but not this idea that we have to collect and collect and collect and that the, you know, the ideal is to have collected billions and billions more than any of us could ever use. So this never-ending desire, I mean, Buddha warned against it. Jesus was implying this all the time that if our mind is captured by always wanting more, then that becomes our entire life. We're consumed by that desire. It rules all of our actions. We may think we're in control, but honestly, we're just a puppet. We're just a puppet to these forces that are towing us along and controlling our actions. And that's probably not where any of us want to be. Now, sometimes these spiritual traditions can tell us we should just eradicate lust from our life. You know what? I'm sorry. Maybe if we're ninja Jedi Zen masters, we're going to be able to accomplish that. But for most of us, there's going to be sexual drives. And are we going to be able to control those? Ah, they're powerful. They're really powerful. And as you know, if you have experienced, oh, cold conditioning, I go into a cold shower when I resist the cold shower, that essentially creates almost that sensation of cold or that pain or discomfort. So it follows very well with any other thing in our life that we resist. If I feel the seeds of anger and I start to clench and tighten and have resistance around that feeling, I'm probably gonna get really mad. If I just look at it and I experience the sensation, I'm going to find that the sensation itself is pretty weak. And I might even start laughing at it. The anger may evaporate. But because we have this culture that celebrates resistance and willpower, always, then we're told that we should try to ignore these feelings. We should try to repress these feelings. We should try to even eradicate these feelings of sexual desire. And when we do that, most of us are going to be beaten down. We're going to end up, again, puppets to this force that comes in, eventually overwhelms our discipline, overwhelms our willpower, and takes us over. It may be super subtle for some of us, just kind of a, a disruption in our daily energy, where if I wasn't taking that energy, thinking about this sexual desire, I might be able to apply it to creativity or other things. Maybe that it's got you into full-blown porn addiction, or it has you going behind the back of your spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever it is in your life and lying to them. Now, early on in my relationship with Rebecca, I was very, <laughs> I don't know what was wrong in my my teen years and then into my 20s I just had a lot of brain chemicals going on maybe and nobody had really said you know hey Ketten when you're going through these teen years and into your 20s there's a good chance that you're gonna be flooded with a lot of brain chemicals that make you do some stupid things and in particular I lived very dangerously I had a motorcycle and I was not safe at all I, out in, in nature, would do hyper-dangerous things. Somehow I got through all of that without ever breaking a bone in my body, let alone dying. But really, really lucky. And so for me, 
They're continued even after Rebecca and I were together. A lot of mental energy going towards my my sexuality. And I had somebody who I considered to be gorgeous. But I still would, would look out and feel my my gaze turning out to other people. Some people say that's fine. And, and maybe for some it is. But to me, it was it was taking energy and putting it somewhere that just wasn't useful for me. You know, and I tend in my spirituality or mental emotional journey to be pretty practical and say, okay, is it inevitable that I see this person and then I get a sexual desire for them and then I'm just going to be thinking about them for the next few days? Or is that just kind of energy that I could use for something else? So over time, in my personal story, I just learned to focus my sexual energy onto Rebecca, to the point today where I call myself a Rebecca sexual. And I can look at another woman and I can see her as beautiful in the way that I would see a tree as beautiful or you know, a, a stream going down to a waterfall, something very aesthetically beautiful. But I don't feel any sexuality towards other people anymore. And that's the extent to which I have conditioned my mind. It's really no different than how I would see somebody's beautiful personality. And I could see that as beautiful. I wouldn't have a sexuality oriented to it. I can appreciate beauty in so many forms, but because it doesn't have sexuality attached, it has allowed for me to have a broader definition of beauty. You know, I remember a time when the, the super young face was the ideal. Now I can look at a woman, a man in their 90s, and I can see the lines in their face and see the beautiful tapestry that is the, the story of their emotions and their life and the way they encountered life, all written in those deeply etched lines in their face. So for me, something incredibly freeing about not being ruled by that sexuality anymore. Now, it doesn't mean I don't still have a lot of sexual energy. I'm actually a very sexual person. And that's aimed towards Rebecca. And so there can also, or there was historically in our relationship, an issue with me having a lot more fixation on this than maybe she wanted to have in our life. And that could cause conflict. So even not porn addicted, not looking outside of my relationship, still even within the relationship, and it wasn't like there wasn't sexuality in the relationship, just not to the amount that I perhaps wanted, then that could create disruptions inside of me. So, so that was affecting me. None of this had to be, but I didn't realize that. I thought of this lust and this sexual desire as a power too potent for me to deal with, maybe for humans in general. There'd be yogis and stuff that were supposedly, you know, proof against this. But then over and over, we know how it works, right? Famous guru types found in some sexual scandal. Certainly, we know about this with priests, sexual sex scandals, people that supposedly have overcome this, but ruled by it. So there was this idea in my mind that this was an unconquerable force. But all of this was because I was trying to fight it. And it's in fighting these things, my friends, where so much of the problem is created. So the solution for me, and perhaps a solution that would work for you, is instead of fighting this lust, this sexual desire, to love it, to enjoy it. And here is the secret that shifted for me. Sexual desire is a feeling that 
we often equate with an end goal. And because our minds are very conditioned, culturally conditioned, to be almost obsessed with the end goal, usually sexual desire must end in orgasm. That is what we are feeling inside. But here is something that was a bit revelatory for me to suddenly realize in my life, and that's that the desire itself is an enjoyable experience. If that is my feeling, then wow, suddenly everything shifts. If it doesn't have to end in a goal, then I can just enjoy the sensation. So for me and my life and my experience, I can look, and I honestly, I, I do this, I can look at Rebecca, have feelings about her and desires about her and imaginings about her. And I say, is this worthwhile in my mental activity? And I've chosen, yes. I enjoy the sensations of having that desire for her. And it tends to just keep me focused. So it's a, a powerful focuser where I can have my attention on her, not be off and mindless, thinking about some whatever. So my attention goes to her an appreciation of her, not just of what I perceive to be her beauty, but also that desire that I feel for her. And this adds a spice to my entire day. And I can be mindful in it, I can appreciate it and enjoy it. And if whatever happens in our day and there's not going to be some sort of fulfillment of that sexual desire, that's okay because the experience itself, just the desire, is an enjoyable thing. And this happens as we start to shift our mind out of that goal orientation and start to appreciate the moment we're in. Now here's where I'm going to plug a meditation practice. And to me, this has become basically a necessity, especially for all of us who aren't at super high level of of awareness because this is basic mind training and it's the same way I would plug walking or doing some sort of movement got to move this body or it's just going to deteriorate we have to move our mind or it's just going to deteriorate and we can move it through doing intellectual things but meditation is a special sort of movement because it is the one thing that makes us aware of what's going on up here. It gets us out of the autopilot and into actually understanding the sensations we're having and being able to say, oh, this is what I am experiencing. So with a meditation practice, when you're talking about lust, sexual desire, it's going to give two huge benefits. First of all, you're going to be aware of the sensation. You're going to be able to say, oh, I am now experiencing sexual desire. And if we notice that happening at its origin, then we can ask a conscious question and say, is this something I want to apply myself to right now? Is this something I want to experience right now? Because we have the choice, especially at that origin, before it's overwhelming us, to say, I'm going to turn my mind over here instead. So for me, I might see Rebecca in some of the stuff she wears in the morning and I might look at her and feel that little origin and say, I'm going to go into appreciation mode and I'm going to tell her how much I appreciate her and she likes that and it's just a very mutual fulfilling experience. But I'm conscious about it. It's not something that just happens that I find myself pulled into involuntarily. Because the meditation allows us to recognize our mind state, then we can begin to recognize sexual desire in ourselves. And the more we recognize it, the more we can back up until we recognize it at its origin.
when it's really small and tiny. Now the second thing that that meditation is going to do for us is that meditation, especially if you're practicing some sort of a focus meditation, where you take your focus and you purposefully put it onto something. Different than the meditation I was just talking about, where we focus on awareness of just whatever's happening inside of our mental sphere. This is purposely focusing our mind. And what that does is it gives us the ability to shift. At first, when I feel very low level sexual desire, it gives me the ability to make that shift to something else if I don't want to be lost in it. If I develop that skill more powerfully, eventually, even if I'm feeling a high level of sexual desire, it allows me to stop and say, wow, this has been a really good sensation, I've enjoyed it, and now I'm going to take a few breaths and I'm going to change my mental focus. And that is a power we all have, but we have to develop it. So to transform lust in our life is a three-step process. The first is to develop this awareness through awareness-based meditation. To do this, we just sit down, we lay down, whatever it is, and we just pay attention to what's happening in our mind. And we notice when we get swept into it and carried away by a thought, and when we can step back and just observe the thoughts. And what we're aiming for is to step back and observe the thoughts. Every time we find ourselves carried away down a mental roadway, we just come back to that observation. And it doesn't matter if at first when we start this meditation, we are lost 90% of the time in mental stories. If we can step back once or twice in a five, 10 minute meditation session and observe our thoughts for even a few moments, that's gonna give us a tiny taste of it. And then it will grow as we go along. Do this long enough and we start to love the sensation of meditation, which gives us a little bonus trick here that I'll explain in a moment. So now, as I start to develop that tool of being able to be aware of what's happening mentally, then this next step can happen, where I start to become more present moment in my life. And I don't become present moment in my life by trying to be present moment. I become present moment by simply soaking into whatever experience is happening. In the same way that during that awareness meditation, I can find my mind being mentally taken off on autopilot down a path, and I find there's a direct correlation to my regular life, where I can find that I'm sitting talking to someone, but my mind has gone off somewhere else, and then I can bring myself back to just being the present observer, to appreciating that I have this friend, that I'm able to communicate with them, that there is this moment of life where I'm able to breathe and be here and experience being alive. As I make that a practice of soaking into the moment I'm in, then more and more I'm able to appreciate the experience I'm having, even if it may be, quote, unpleasant in some ways. So that's the moment when we get into a cold shower and we love it and it's amazing or that we get a scratch from some briars and we look down and we see the blood flowing and we feel the brightness of the pain and it's not a bad thing so this is available to all of us it's just soaking into the present moment and with lust or desire it means that even though lust or desire right now might have an aim towards must end in orgasm, we find ourselves more and more able to experience this part. So in soaking into the present moment, I cultivate this ability to enjoy the process I'm in and not always have to have it have an end goal, a successful end goal. As this develops, it bleeds out into the rest of my life so that I can enjoy the process of reaching for a goal, a personal, maybe a fitness goal, but if I don't achieve it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time self-punishing 
I'm just going to reset my goal, recalibrate, and move on on it. So you can see there how developing this skill is something that applies to your whole life. And we can see how sexual desire can either condition our mind to that never-ending desire that our culture celebrates and tries to lure us into with every advertisement, or we can enjoy the process we're in. That doesn't mean that we can't reach for a goal. We can't hope that there is something out here at the end. But this is not what all of this is about. All of this is just as important as that end goal. And then finally, that third step is developing the mental focus. And with the mental focus, phew, wow. Now if I ever do find myself overwhelmed, I can go in and I can shift my mental focus. And here's that little trick about the meditation. When meditation starts to feel really good, and it does for a lot of us. In fact, a lot of the yogis warn that you can get blissed out in meditation and you kind of stuck in that and wanting to just be in meditative bliss all the time. Now, I'm certainly not <laughs> that tempted by meditation, but I have gotten to the point with certain types of meditation where it just feels really, really good, where I would want to desire to sit in there for quite a while. And when we have that, then if I'm feeling overwhelmed, oh, was, I really wish that my feelings for Rebecca would culminate in a sexual experience and it doesn't look like it's going to because the neighbors just stopped over and everything's shifting and changing in our day, then I can stop, I can go into some meditation and that itself is a very pleasant sensation. And I don't have to feel like something big was lost because I'm going from that one pleasant sensation, but I'm replacing it with another really pleasant sensation. But back to that focus, that focus, like everything else here, gives you tremendous power in all other aspects of your life. So in this way, perhaps we can look at lust in our life, if it is a force that you wrestle with, and instead of saying, ah, I wish this was gone, say, what a gift that I can experience this. What a gift, because this is not only a pleasant experience that I can have in my life, that can add spice to my daily experience, but it is a perfect training tool for life in general. Because if I follow this three-step method and I practice developing awareness of my mind's activity, and I practice soaking into the present moment and enjoying it and loving it for what it is. And I practice learning to focus my mind where I am telling it to go. With those three tools, whew, we get back onto the, into the driver's seat, essentially. We become the, the helmsman, the helmswoman of our own ship. And the surprise for most of us when we get there is that we find that even though we thought before that our ideas were our own ideas and our desires were our own desires and the things that we wanted in life, maybe even our life goals were our own life goals, we often discover at that point that those things weren't really ours. They were given to us by cultural forces and never really examined. That mind can be broken through to it might suddenly see, wait a second, this actually isn't how I think about the world. Maybe I've just been taken for a ride. Maybe I've allowed my mind to be controlled by some of the ultra-powerful forces of control, of attempted mind control in our culture. Every advertisement we see is attempting to manipulate our sense of desire, our mental state. And advertisements that's not the only place it's happening so so many forces ideas and currents that run through our culture that form who we think of as ourselves but we can get back into the helm and when we do wow 
it's amazing. When we do, it feels like suddenly we're alive again and this huge weight comes off of us that we've been carrying, that we didn't even realize we were carrying. It was the weight of all this baggage, this kind of control, this stuff that was just blah, weighing us down. So share in the comments if you've had battles with that force of lust. And if this idea resonates with you of instead of fighting it or trying to eradicate it, of loving it. In fact, developing our mind so that we can love a very wide variety of sensations in our life. And that we don't have to have our mind projecting to some distant future goal, but we can just love the moment we're in. Soak into it. Immerse ourselves in it. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts down in the comments. And as always, I get to learn from you. We get to share. It's beautiful and amazing. And I'm very grateful for all that sharing that people do. All right, my friends. Love to you all. And we'll talk with you in the comments. And by the way, I haven't taken that advice that I hear from so many YouTubers to always tell people to please subscribe, hit the bell, and share. Hopefully, if you like this content, you're going to do that. But sharing apparently does make a big difference. And if you find this content valuable and you think that sharing it out with the world is important, you can help this channel grow. And you can help these words get out to the world by sharing with anybody that you think might benefit from it. One more little bottle of love. Grateful for you all.